This book was sensational. This book was boring. I'm Louisa May Alcott, and I disown you both. Welcome to the two retired homeschoolers. I'm Holly Matthews, and this is Rebecca. And between the two of us, we have six sisters, so we brought along an extra one as our first guest on the podcast. Hi! Introduce yourself, Rose. My name is Rose, and I'm a youngest sister of three. Yes, you are. Uh, Today's book that we'll be reviewing is is Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. Little Women is um, the story of some sisters in the 1860s. And we already kind of explained the plot in last week's episode, so shameless plug, go listen to that. Yes, indeed. And the book follows their stories as they grow up from being children and go their separate ways as adults. So Rose, you read this book recently for the first time. Yes. Well, before I started reading it, I really, it was for school, so whenever I first started reading it, I really did not want to read it because I thought it was going to be really boring. Um, but then I read it, and it was surprisingly, like, I, I kept wanting to turn the page. So, yeah, it was, I liked it. Good. I guess she just made you interested in the characters. Like, maybe not, like, the plot was amazing, but, like, the characters I liked a lot. Something about it, I just kept wanting to, it was, yeah, I didn't want to, like, not read it. Mm-hmm. All right, your first impressions, Rebecca? Well, they're more like fifth or impressions or something. Like. <laughs> Can you remember <laughs> your first impression? Hmm. Actually, yes, kind of. Little Women was not actually the first Louisa May Alcott book I read. Mom read Under the Lilacs to me, which I really liked. And I also read Eight Cousins on my own, which I really liked. And then I wanted to read Little Women, but I was reading it one day. And mom came in and saw me reading it. Like, I don't know. I don't think she said I was too young to read it. But, like, I don't know. She made me think that she didn't want me to read it or that it wasn't that good of a book or something. And so, in my mind, it was, like, the forbidden Louisa May Alcott book. Which is, that's kind of extreme. But that's kind of what it was. And then I finally did read it. And I liked it a lot. I actually, it used to not be my favorite of her books. Like, I used to definitely like several other of her books better. And I probably still do. But I... I like it more every time I read it. It it becomes more likable. Like when you're a little kid, you like it, and then when you're a teenager, you're like, oh, this is even more relatable. And then when you're an adult, you're like, oh, this is really re-. like I don't know. It just becomes more yeah. interesting to your life as you get older. So you like it more. That was my mm-hmm. exact same impression uh, of this book. And this wasn't exactly my first time reading it, but it was very much a book where it's like, it feels like this would be a required reading in like middle school or something. And then you wouldn't fully appreciate it until like you were either going through the transition between childhood and womanhood or like you already were a young woman looking back, seeing all the things that the characters were experiencing it. Or even as like an older person, I, I feel like it's a book really for all ages. My first impressions were coming off of watching the movie, which I absolutely love. And so the way I interpreted the book was heavily influenced by that, but there were some parts of the book that I think went back and influenced how I saw the movie. And I almost think that they're both equally as good. Uh, Little Woman is very long and it takes some discipline to read, but it's one of my absolute most favorite books. And as far as like the wisdom it has packed in it, I would say it's like second to the Bible on my list. But actually, I I haven't really thought about C.S. Lewis compared to Little Women, so maybe not. But (laughs) it's definitely up there. (laughs) Okay, so uh, Louisa May Alcott was born in 1832 and died in 1888 at the age of 55. She wrote the book when she was 36, and actually, um, it wasn't the first book she had written, but her publisher, Thomas Niles, was the one who really pushed her to do it, and he had the idea originally. Uh, she responded, quote, I could not write a girl's story knowing little about any but my own sisters and always preferring boys. So at first she found the book very boring, so she was uh, hesitant to publish it. She actually wrote it in 10 weeks, which is very impressive considering it's over 600 pages um, and even over 700, depending on your copy. I think it's officially like 700 and. 20 something pages. Anyway, um, the book was really well accepted. The first 2000 copies. It's only, 500, it's only 500 pages in our copy. Oh, really? In mine, it's like 640 mm-hmm. something. According to Wikipedia, it's like 720 something. Hmm. Anyway, so the book was really well accepted. It sold its first 2000 copies so fast that the publishing companies couldn't keep up. And 
Alcott drew a lot of the inspiration from the book from her personal life. So like the oldest sister was a reflection of her oldest older sister, Anna. Joe was inspired by Louisa herself and she was the second oldest. Like so the age olders are all are all in place. The third oldest was Lizzie, who is depicted by Beth, and she actually died from lingering effects of scarlet fever when she was twenty three. And then there's Amy, who is the youngest, who um, in real life her name was May. And she, interestingly enough, drew the illustrations for the first copy of the book. Um, And in the book, Amy was an artist, so that's really cool. I did not realize that Beth's death was based on her actual sister's death. I did not know that. Yeah, it's really crazy. And the fact that they died the same way, too. So she really, she wrote what she knew, for sure. The family suffered from poverty because their father couldn't find work for much of their childhood. So, um... I don't know about her sisters, but I know at least Louisa had to work to help support the family. And she herself wrote sensational novels earlier in in her career that focused on passion and revenge. You did? (laughs) Yeah, I read her first novel, uh, The Inheritance, I think it was called. And like, yes, it's like a improbable romantic story, but it is totally not like passionate and revengeful and (laughs) <laughs> like, that's a total exaggeration. <laughs> like, it's much sweeter and nicer than that. Okay. And and it was from her yeah. very early career that you read it? Yeah, it was like her first published novel, I think. Interesting. Well, the reason why I bring that up is because Joe in the story, who is the depiction of Louisa, like I said earlier, uh, she, like, wrote a bunch of sensational stories, like, more short stories to be published in the newspaper. And... um you can see that Alcott looked down on those and like thought that the, like the morals weren't great about them. Um, and also the right. reason why I brought up the fact that their family suffered from poverty is because that is also one of the major premises of the March family in the story. Those are just some random facts that pertain to the story itself. About Alcott's life, she was an abolitionist, a feminist, and uh, she dedicated a lot of her life to women's suffrage and temperance movements. And she also served as a nurse in the Civil War I think she planned on serving for like three months, but she contracted um, typhoid fever and was treated with a compound Mm. containing mercury, which many historians attribute to a lot of her health issues. She actually died from the stroke two days after her dad died. The last thing I have is she wrote a sequel to Little Woman called Little Men that follows the life of Jo um, after she's married and is like heading this boys school and it's basically a book about a lot of the lessons the boys learn as they grow up i don't like that one as much but it's okay there's even a sequel to that one called joe's boys which is when like even some of the boys have started to grow up and i really don't like that one really what did you not like about them a little men was just not as um just not as good as the other not as interesting and joe's boys it kind of felt like she was just tired of her characters and she was just doing stuff and like the thing that makes me mad is there was a character, Dan, and he had, like, anger issues or whatever, but then he, like, grows up, and he's a man, and he goes off to make his way in the world, and something happens, and he kills someone, but he does it in, like, self-defense. Like, it's not... He gets into a situation, right, in, like, the West, because this book was written when the Wild West was literally still a thing. So he, like, has to kill someone in self-defense, and then he goes to jail, and blah, 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 and whatever, and she makes it out like he did something wrong, and it was part of his anger issues, but like it wasn't and like and now he can never be with the girl that he's in love with because she's just too wonderful and pure and he's sunk himself beneath her by killing someone in self-defense like it just was no like i that was what my favorite character in the book and that was what happened to him and i was just mad yeah that's interesting. I need to read more of her works because Little Women is all I've ever read, which is rather typical because it's her most famous. <laughs> yeah, you want so bad to be a hipster, but you've read Pride and Prejudice I'm, and Little Women. I'm hopelessly not. and It's terrible. <laughs> all right, so let's now talk about our favorite sisters and why. Uh, let's have our guest Rose start. Well, thank you. You can help me. <laughs> really, who's your favorite sister? Well, I guess there's things in each of them I like, and then some of them I don't like. And so I don't really have a Joe, I'll say Joe's my favorite. Why? Uh, she's very amusing to read about. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, that's about it. You just like her because she's funny? Yeah, and I do like how she like is all like, it was my fault that Beth had to go over there. I'm the one in 
the frog, you know, and she's just like very dramatic, but in like not an annoying way, just a really funny way. Uh huh. So yeah, just her personality is funny. And why were you not sure about naming her your favorite? Um. Well, what do you not like about her? I think that she gets too serious at the end. Hmm. Like, she, like, like, yeah, bad things happen, but you don't have to let that make you completely a serious person for the rest of your life. Which I don't think that it was that serious, but, you know, she was, maybe, more it was just probably my, it was just sad because she had to go through all that stuff with Beth dying. And, and so she just, it was just sad. So I didn't like it because it was sad, but I also thought that she was very serious at the end. Like, like more, way more so than she was. Yeah, it is pretty awful to be a serious person. I <laughs> <laughs> what about you? You know, my favorite used to always be Amy, um, mainly because of the second half of the book. She grows up so nicely. But this time, my favorite was Joe. I've changed. I I kind of think it's partly because um, I more and more identify with Joe's philosophy of life. Like Amy is concerned with politeness and being in the proper society, and giving everyone like she's she's concerned with playing the game. Joe does not care about the game. Joe wants to be in her own world doing her own things. She cares specifically about having the approval of the people whose approval she respects on a level completely unconnected to social status. And she doesn't, like, sometimes she makes things harder for herself because she should be a little more polite and polished. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, she's just herself and she's not mean and she's not even rude. She just doesn't care about society. She doesn't care about the rules of the game. She finds it irrelevant and kind of silly and she just wants to excel at what she wants to excel at and hang out with the people that she likes. Now Amy of course is good at playing the game so she likes the game. Joe's not good at it so she well realizes that she doesn't need it but the thing is that if you play by the rules of the game then like you can be hurt by the other players but if the other players just make fun of you for not playing the game who cares? You don't want to play their stupid game anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So I just, I like Joe's independent spirit. And I, I just relate to her a lot more now than I did as a little child. Because as a little child, I never had a problem with losing my temper the way Joe does. So Oh, so you've gotten less mature than when you are a little kid. You <laughs> no, I'm saying that that was what stuck out to me when I was little, was her impulsiveness, her heedlessness, her hot, hot temper. Yeah. And now what sticks out to me is her stubborn independent streak her like she doesn't care what other people think her backbone and her yeah lack of caring what other people think and i really like that mm. what about you holly okay so my favorite character was always joe but having heard you talk about amy more in the last episode uh it kind of made me open my mind more to appreciating her as a character i think like her as a kid just kind of I could connect her to several different people in my life and it's like okay i have this character figured out and so i wasn't as intrigued by her as much uh but especially seeing her character development and stuff i've liked amy almost as much as joe now and joe i probably connect to the, the most overall but amy as a as a like a an adult like i just find her so interesting um and beth has always been really up there too um because of her gentleness and whatnot and just wanting to be like a good person and I find a little part of myself which is a part of myself I admire and would like to grow more <laughs> that relates to Beth <laughs> um but I also very much admire like passion and fearlessness and uh accomplishment which you can see more reflected in Joe and Amy's journeys and then Meg I've never related to so I would have to say it's between Beth Joe or uh Amy <laughs> All that narrows it down. <laughs> Actually, you said earlier that Meg is boring and, like, every typical woman wants to be a wife and have kids like a typical boring woman. Do you stand by that statement or was it a joke? It was more of a joke. And actually, I think she's more that way in the movies or the movie. I really only think of one movie when I think of Little Woman. In the book, you could definitely see more of her complicated humanity-ness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like... Yeah, she wasn't reduced to simply being someone who wanted to be a wife and mother. That was her highest ambition, which is good. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't like she was boring because she didn't have any other personality traits. Yeah. Um, in the book, Amy as a... Or Meg. Oh my goodness, why do I always get those two confused? Meg as a, a kid is very concerned with like being proper, leaving childish ways behind, which I was more of a 
like a, I'll never grow up type of a person. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> and then as an adult, she's more concerned with like her life of kids and a husband, which and I can really appreciate her struggles and I see that in a, a lot of other people I know. So I found her much more interesting as an adult and and I think I will relate to her even more as I grow up. But for now, just the seasons of my life and also her personality, I don't feel like we relate to each other that much, which is why I find her slightly boring. But I, uh, in the book, I definitely appreciate her so much more. But do you now see why, like, if I read this book... I love John. ...and had this John Brooke... Yeah, he's great, isn't he? He's amazing. I love him so much. <laughs> um, Favorite quotes? Okay, so this is a quote about Amy. So basically this whole, like, page and a half, they're talking about how she's trying all these different, like, things for art. And one time she gets her foot stuck in something. Okay, but it says, If genius is eternal patience, as Michelangelo affirms, Amy certainly had some claim to the divine attribute. For she persevered in spite of all obstacles, failures, and discouragements, firmly believing that in time she should do something worthy to be called high art. Why is that your favorite? It's... Well, it's kind of, it's true, kind of. That genius is eternal patience? Uh-huh. Yeah. You'll never get smart if you don't have the patience to learn. This is true. But I also think that if, yeah. Yeah, what do you think of Amy's art and her artistic attempts and her artistic philosophy, since you actually are an artist? Well, it's... I mean, does it does it ring true? Is she, like, an actual artist? Yeah. I would say I don't really know that much in the book. It doesn't really talk about that much about it. I mean, it sounds like she is. I think it's, like, under a relatable that she tries all these different things to see what she likes. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it takes a while for her to figure it out. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I think it's interesting to watch, watch what someone else has a problem with when they're figuring out art. Yeah. What about, what do you think about when she, like, kind of gives up her art? Like, she decides that she can't be the greatest artist ever, so she's not even going to do it. I think she should still do it for fun, unless she really doesn't enjoy it. But I think that if she did enjoy it, and just because she's not the best, then that's silly of her to stop. This is my favorite quote. Amy's lecture did Laurie good, though, of course, he did not own it till long afterward. Men seldom do, for when women are the advisors, the lords of creation don't take the advice till they have persuaded themselves that it is just what they intended to do. Then they act upon it, and, if it succeeds, they give the weaker vessels half the credit of it. If it fails, they generously give her the whole. That's so true, though. (laughs) Yeah, okay. I have several favorite quotes. I love the fact that she called babies little red squirmers. Yeah. Um, I also like the part where Marmy says to Joe, You I leave to enjoy your liberty till you tire of it, for only then will you find that there is something sweeter. I think that's really interesting and an interesting parental philosophy. I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I just thought that was interesting but my favorite quote of all joe preferred imaginary heroes to real ones because when tired of them the former could be shut up in the tin kitchen till called for and the latter were less manageable yes i love that quote (laughs) all right let's talk about didactic writing and the fact that alcott very intentionally wrote morals into her into her stories yeah her writing is straight up like then joe forgave and found forgiveness the sweeter for its tender fragrance (laughs) which cast the evening in a new light of penitence and grace um because when we let the sun go down on our anger it festers like a boil and it's very bad for us but when we don't (laughs) then we find out that forgiveness is good (laughs) that was (laughs) that went downhill but just, that is kind of how she writes like she just straight up says the moral she doesn't just like illustrate it with her story she like yeah yeah it's just it's really interesting to me and i um actually used to try to write like this because when i was like 11 years old or whatever louise a alcott lucy maud montgomery and charles dickens were my favorite authors and i wanted to write with the same style as them so i wrote this book i think when i was 12 um that was kind of a, like a domestic little drama like little women except it took place on the American frontier and I totally like hoped that my writing style was like this exquisite mixture of Dickens, Alcott, (laughs) and Montgomery and I can go back and look at some of the passages I wrote and like Louise Malcott's good at it somehow like her the didactic tone just works it doesn't it's not grating the way a lot of writers are but um I'm a lot of writers and it was very grating in in my 12 year old magnum opus (laughs) 
<laughs> but it, it, it honestly really impresses sweet. me. Like, I don't know how she makes it good to read, if that makes sense. You know? Yeah, no. I Okay, basically, I was always under the impression that good writing had a point to it and morals, but, like, y- your job was to set the stage for the moral, and then the reader's job was to extract that out and draw the conclusion for themselves. And I, I think there's authors that do that a lot. There's also authors that will write a story without really much of moral intent, but they want there to be conclusions drawn from it. They just leave that completely up to the reader. And then there's writing like this, didactic, which is very much like, here's the more moral, and not only am I going to imply it heavily, I'm going to tell you what it is. <laughs> and I agree that somehow Alcott is able to do it where it doesn't feel preachy and it's very good. But here's one of my other favorite quotes, which very much illustrates this. And this is Mrs. Marsh talking to Joe. I gave my best to the country I love and kept my tears till he, talking about her husband, Mr. March, was gone. Why should I complain when we both have merely done our duty and will surely be the happier for it in the end? If I don't seem to need help, it is because I have a better friend, even than father, to comfort and sustain me. My child, the troubles and temptations of your life are beginning and may be many, but you can overcome it and outlive them all if you learn to feel the strength and tenderness of your heavenly father, as you do that of your earthly one. The more you love and trust him, the nearer you will feel to him, and the less you will depend on human power and wisdom. His love can never tire or change, can never be taken from you, but may become the source of lifelong peace, happiness, and strength. Believe this heartily, and go to God with all your little cares and hopes and sins and sorrows, as freely and confidently as you came to your mother. So, that's one of the parts that really screams. (laughs) Morals! (laughs) Yeah, so forgiveness... Uh, I don't have much to say about forgiveness itself and how Alcott reflects it, other than to say it was brought up in the book when Joe forgives Amy after Amy burned her book because Amy was mad at Joe for not letting her go to a ball and also making her do her homework. And um, another point where it was really pushed is when Amy forgives like the upper class girls after they make fun of her for her art, but also just kind of they it's a long story but basically they thought joe was like gossiping which she kind of was and so they were mad at her so then they like took revenge out on her by like making her i don't know how to explain it it was at an art fair what how would you explain it rebecca (laughs) um like female manipulation as only females can do it (laughs) yeah pretty much i liked that instance of forgiveness in the book i don't like the first one Hmm. um rose would you ever do what Amy did to Joe? No. If you were mad, like, could you get mad enough that you would do Not that? Not that extreme, though. You, if there was something you loved that much, even if I was so mad at you, I might, like, burn your clothes or something, but I would never <laughs> burn something that you treasure so much. No, I thought that was a little bit, like, wow. You really did that? I think I'm surprised. Yeah. What would you Me do too. That? No, I don't think I would. If I actually, like, I hope that my anger would never take me that far. Because... Okay, the reason I don't like that thing, it's fine that Amy's anger did take her that far, or perhaps she didn't understand how important it truly was to Joe. How irreplaceable. I don't think she did completely. But, like, I don't like how the narrative frames that. Mostly it's a very natural little story, but in this particular case, Joe's mad at Amy, and she stays mad, and then Amy comes out and falls into the ice because Joe didn't wait for her. And then they have to rescue her, and she's just so happy that her sister didn't die that she forgives her on the spot and is remorseful for not Mm. forgiving her sooner. And I don't like how that's framed because, okay, you know what? I forget where this was said in the book. It was not said in this place, but it said, hearts like flowers cannot be rudely handled but must open naturally, which I liked. And I feel like that kind of applies to this. Like, yeah, Joe should forgive Amy, but... I don't want you to make such a contrived situation where, of course, she has to forgive her. She doesn't have to work through how angry she is and how she has to forgive her anyway. Because when it's obvious to her, like, I value my sister's life and relationship more than nursing my anger, of course she's going to forgive her. But you don't usually get to come to conclusions like that in life through such a dramatic event. You usually have to work it out for yourself. And I really wish the book had just had Joe work it out in a more natural way. It just felt like such a cheat and such a way to say forgiveness is important in an unnatural way. Well, yeah, I feel like before that happened, though, her mom was talking to uh, Joe. Everyone was like, and Joe was thinking, 
Should I forgive her? No, I'm too mad at her. You know, I don't think like it was just all of a sudden. I feel like it was, like, she did put little points in there where she was thinking, should I forgive her? No, I'm mad at her. You know, so it wasn't like all of a sudden, true. But it makes it so blindingly obvious that, of course, she has to forgive her. Mm-hmm. It, 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 that's all I have to say about, about forgiveness. I do like how it's handled in the part with Amy. I think that's one of the reasons I like Amy. She's such a, she's so interesting. She's such a quiet, she's so normal, but, like, virtuous, which isn't as normal as you would think it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I actually do like how, I like how Amy fell through the ice and Joe felt the importance of forgiveness because I think it was a good illustration for the forgi- the importance of forgiveness. What I don't like about that specific plot line is how Alcott very much draws the connection between forgiveness itself and feeling and and the feelings of forgiveness, if you want to call it that. Like like this I can't talk to gay. Basically your anger subsiding because I don't think they're the same thing. I think forgiveness is very much relinquishing your right, if you want to call it, of revenge. And you can still remain angry at the wrong done to you even after like you've forgiven someone because it takes time and again realizing how important your relationship with the other person or whatever is before you fully heal yeah and i also think that now i'm thinking about it more it kind of did i didn't hate it that much because like when she saw her and she realized hey she could die you know and she saves her it it's more like she realizes how minor what amy did to her was versus amy's life like, are you really going to make that, are you going to let that mistake make you hate someone that is, you know, that you actually do love? Mm-hmm. Doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Good transition, Rebecca. <laughs> Joe and Mr. Bear are with Mrs., what's her face? Are with Miss Norton. Norton at... Uh, like a intellectual conference where people like philosophize and debate debate so the conversation was miles beyond joe's comprehension but she enjoyed it though kant and hegel were unknown gods the subjective and objective unintelligible terms and the only thing evolved from her inner consciousness in quotes was a bad headache after it was all over it dawned upon her gradually that the world was being picked to pieces and put together on new and, according to the talkers, on infinitely better principles than before. That religion was in a fair way to be reasoned into nothingness, and intellect was to be the only god. Joe knew nothing about philosophy or metaphysics of any sort, but a curious excitement, half pleasurable, half painful, came over her as she listened with a sense of being turned to drift into time and space, like a young balloon out on a holiday. She looked round to see how the professor liked it, and found him looking at her with the grimmest expression she had ever seen him wear. He shook his head and beckoned her to come away, but she was fascinated just then by the freedom of speculative philosophy, and kept her seat, trying to figure out, trying to find out what the wisest gentleman intended to rely upon after they had annihilated all the old beliefs. Now, Mr. Bear was a diffident man, and slow to offer his own opinions, not because they were unsettled, but too sincere and earnest to be lightly spoken. As he glanced from Joe to several other people, attracted by the brilliancy of the philosophical pyrotechnics, he knit his brows and longed to speak, fearing that some inflammable young soul would be led astray by the rockets, to find, when the display was over, that they had only an empty stick or a scorched hand. He bore it as long as he could, but when he was appealed to for an opinion, he blazed up with honest indignation and defended religion with all the eloquence of truth an eloquence which made his broken English musical and his plain face beautiful. He had a hard fight, for the wise men argued well, but he didn't know when he was beaten, and stood to his colors like a man. Somehow, as he talked, the world got right again to Joe. The old beliefs that had lasted so long seemed better than the new. God was not a blind force, and immortality was not a pretty fable, but a blessed fact. She felt as if she had solid ground under her feet again, and when Mr. Bear paused, out talked but no one went convinced. Joe wanted to clap her hands and thank him. So I took this very, very long quote out because <laughs> I think this illustrates something which I've experienced in my own life, like the temptation and the attraction to intellect over, over what you know to be true in your gut and how that can really confuse you. And also I think it's, it's important to note that part of what makes the people wrong and Mr. Bear right is that logic is very much it it very much relies on values and values come from morals 
and you can't explain morals with logic without a god, um, which is why human logic can lead people to very dark places or, or places that are really illogical. Because, like I said, if it's not governed by values, then it's just kind of like, well, what premise do you have for logic? You, you can logic your way into really anything. Um, and a good example of this is like the Nazis and like kind of taking the, the moral compass of Darwinism and saying the weaker deserve to die and so the stronger can exist better, you know? So that was something I, I really liked. At, at the same time, doubt is so important and I feel that the Christian community should all always be very accepting of it and encourage it because it's not a weakness of faith. It's what makes your faith grow. And it's a sign that like you are interested in what you believe and, and, and in knowing why you believe what you believe. Yeah, with the caveat that if you just doubt and then you're just like, man, I just don't know. And then you do nothing and don't find out, that's not helpful. That's you know very I mean? true. Yeah. Yeah. I just can't stand it when people look down on other people for doubting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. But I also can't stand it. When people are like, yeah, but like, how could the God of the Old Testament be the same God as the God of the New Testament, man? It just doesn't make sense to me. And then they just sit with that for like two years and then they didn't ever try to find anything out about it. But after two years of it rankling in their mind, they're just like, yeah, I guess I'm not a Christian because, you know, no one answered my questions that I didn't ask. Yeah, you know, I, I mean? think there's a difference between genuine doubt and like not wanting to believe something like unbelief or, or yeah. unwillingness to have your ideas challenged, which is pretty much the opposite of doubt, actually, so. Did you like that part where he, ex like, kind of defended the truth? Oh, I love that part. I thought you did. <laughs> <laughs> the book talks a lot about the value of work, like, healthy work, having work to do. There's a whole chapter where they have an experiment where they just, they don't work. They just do whatever they want. It was terrible. Pretty much. Yeah, because it sucked Need the work. joy out of fun. And it made work even more painful. So it's basically a lose-lose situation, which I've experienced in my own life. Yeah, like whenever you have like a school break, you know, you hate school and then you get off and you're like, yay, freedom. And then you have nothing to do. <laughs> and it's just so boring. Another part where it was emphasized was Meg learning how to be a mother with the babies. And she basically committed all of herself to her work with the babies, which very much stole the joy out of her life and upset the balance of also her marriage with John Brooke. And speak up, young podcaster. <laughs> I felt so bad for him. Yeah, no, Meg has to learn to balance. Like, well, I think it's interesting. She has to balance her husband and her children. Yeah. yeah, but he did a good way of showing her. He didn't just tell her. He was just like, he left. He showed it. This is what you're doing to me. This is what I'm doing to you. <laughs> well, and the reason I like that park so much is because I very much related to it with school. Like, if you do not boss around your school life, your school life will rule you and take over you. Um, and so you have to learn, like, one of the boundaries I set in place for myself for a while was, like, I'm not going to do any school after 5 p.m., which helped in more ways than one. Um, it helped with procrastination during the day when I really should have been working the most because I knew like I wouldn't be able to do this past 5 p.m., which helped me get better sleep. So just like putting boundaries in place really helps, um, but also realizing that other things matter just as much, if not more than even these things that you consider your highest responsibilities, like having children and taking care of them. So a big thing in this book is the girls have ambitions like they are ambitious girls and it's one of the it's one of the big moral themes of the book i feel like is personal ambition versus vocation and i just thought it was really interesting how it played out in the book all right what do you think holly really reminds me of the verse like many are the plans of a man's heart but it is god's purpose that prevails because it's like there's an interesting conflict that you go through as a christian where it's like okay okay, I have ambitions, I have desires, I believe God gave me these desires for a reason, and they can point to the purpose he has for my life, but my ideas and the way I'm envisioning this coming about can be very different from what he actually intends to do with those desires, and because we create visions when we're younger and, and dreams, we can kind of set how we define success off of those, and sometimes our definition of success very much uh, contrast to God. So like with Joe's journey, all she wants to do is write like the the next best American novel, right? And she's struggling and she can't get there. And really her writing journey 
is very important because it it brings her closer to like Mr. Bear and who she needs to marry to help her with her um, career in helping. Basically, she starts a school for boys. And, and it also shows how her aunt died just at the right time so that she could like ha- use it as a school and how God very much intended that to be how things went down. <laughs> so yeah, I think hope and our sense of hope is very much wrapped up in that as well. I'm not speaking very well right now, but you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I do understand what you're saying. Some Christians don't really believe in vocation. Like, they don't really believe you have a vocation Mm. that you need to, like, I don't know. And I always feel bad for people like that because I do feel like there's a lot of hope that's wrapped up in that. That, like, God has a thing that he wants you to do, and if you do it, you're fulfilled. And so you need to be pursuing that. And it usually has something to do with your other ambitions, whether you never know how it will turn out. That's very, like, it never turns out how you expect it is kind of how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. But like you said, like, Joe pursuing her writing even though that wasn't what she she didn't in the end become the next great american novelist that was how she got where she needed to be right like yeah and so i i just feel like people who don't really believe in that who don't believe in following your dreams as it were are missing out because then you're just going to be like stuck forever doing the right thing but sometimes joylessly yeah because like sometimes god wants you to yes contentment is a great virtue but like Sometimes God wants you to go out and pursue what he's put it into you to desire in the first place. Like, sometimes he calls you out of your home. I feel like a belief in vocation is kind of an important thing. And it works out. It works out. I like like how this book handles that. I like how it, it just, it's really nice with all the sisters. Yeah. The reason why I brought up the definitions of success is because I really liked how Joe kept I didn't I didn't love that she felt like a failure, but I like seeing how it flipped over and it's like she thought she was a failure because she was writing these stories that actually did get published, but then she came around and was like, you know what, this isn't what I should be writing. And then like when she did write what she wanted, what she thought was the good things for her to write, like they weren't being published or whatever. Um, and then she kept being distracted by like home life or work life from what she really wanted to do. So all, or she wasn't making enough money when she was making money. So all along, she felt like she was failing. But if you look at her life from the standpoint of what it, it appears that God was leading her into, what with starting the school for boys and impacting so many people's lives, which in the end, of course, God's plan was better than her own. It's like you can see how all the check marks were aligned and how like her moving away at the right time and meeting Mr. Bear at the right time and her aunt dying at the right time and Beth's death like they all align so perfectly so all along she was succeeding and she didn't know it yeah yeah i like that all along she was succeeding and she didn't know it and then Lori's love for joe even though joe didn't want to marry him we don't i don't have anything to say about it do you i have yes you do i forgot a lot to say about something (laughs) it's not even about the romance between laurie laurie and um joe it's more about the friendship it, when I read the book, Rebecca got something completely different, so this might not be for you, but literally it, it was like they were best friends, you know? They argued a lot, but they were, you know, really good friends, right? And then he had to have feelings for her, and she said, sorry, no. But after she said no, their relationship never became good friends again, in my opinion. It never seemed like they were really, like, they, yeah, they were friends, but not it not good friends at all like at all i wouldn't say and they're like yeah they're grown up they have their own half wife and husband but like it feels like it's sad because like i feel like they should have been able to be friends maybe i'm just thinking like it's not going to be the same as when they're little kids that's true the so, book yeah. itself they, said that yeah it did that would have been one of my favorite quotes but it was so sad i wasn't gonna read it <laughs> yeah that is sad and Maybe that's why so many people are just so unreconciled to the fact that she didn't marry Laurie. Like, you know how, like, most people will die on the hill of shipping Laurie and Joe? Mm Mm-hmm. Maybe that's why, because they have such a great relationship and they don't feel like it's resolved. Yeah, it's not resolved. That's what I think. But I also don't think that they would... I think that she definitely made a good choice in saying no. (laughs) Because, like, yeah, that wouldn't work. And also, he and Amy are perfect together. 
Yeah, okay. That, it I... was perfect. And actually, Rebecca, I think I figured out what was wrong with them marrying. I think it, the reason why it was wrong is because the Joe, the chemistry between Joe and Laurie was very much relied on how Laurie was as a kid. But at the same time, it would have been bad for all the reasons their mother brought up about them fighting and having conflicting personalities and different ambitions for life. If they were to get married, I think it would only really succeed and that chemistry would only last if Laurie stayed the same, which it was important and necessary for Laurie to grow up and not become a different person, but he did change in some senses that Amy was great for him in. And so if Laurie were to change into more of a man with Joe, that marriage in and of itself would have been a horrible one. Um, So that's part of the reason why I think Laurie liked Joe and wanted to marry her as they were going through that transition between childhood and adulthood and why even then it still looked like it could totally work out. The last um, major theme that we recognized in the book was gratitude and the importance thereof. What did you say about like after reading it? What did you say? Yeah. You said something. I'm not even sure totally why but reading the marches struggling through poverty and the girls realizing that like love and virtue and having solid relationships are so much more important than money, even in, even in a practical sense. It really made me very grateful for my own four sisters and my family and the fact that I have a relationship with God and my friends. And like, it, like I just felt so much more fulfilled and grateful after reading this book <laughs> about my own life. I love Marmy. She is such an amazing character. I love their mom. And I feel like that was one of the good things about her. There's many good things about her, but she just, like, taught her girls to be grateful. Like, I think that's what parents should do. Yeah. yeah. And I love that Marmy taught them by example, by living out gratitude in her own life. And also I love that she taught them gratitude by letting them go through experiences of life where they hard learn the hard way. I mean, she not only told them, she led by example and also let them go through stuff. <laughs> the ultimate question, are the marches... Christian. I guess a little background for this question. We watched the movie and they mentioned transcendentalism and um, transcendentalism and Christianity are different. And then we looked up and like Louisa May Alcott's family was at least involved with transcendentalism, but we couldn't tell if she was Christian or transcendentalist. And so reading the book, we were like, well, we've always assumed the Marches are a Christian family, but we're going to see like are they or are they just a transcendentalist family? And so we went through the whole book being like, oh, well, I don't know. That could be Christian or transcendentalist. Well, that could be Christian. Oh, well, that didn't sound very Christian. They must be transcendentalist. Oh, but no, they said that. They have to be Christian. That's how we went through the whole book. So that's that's the background. Transcendentalism is a philosophy that was very popular in America in the early mid, mid 19th century where basically they use a lot of Christian terms, but they don't really believe in like heaven or a personal God. They believe that the divine is inherent in the everyday, in nature, and civilization has ruined mankind to some extent, and we need to get back to our roots, get back to nature. We're fundamentally good. We need to reconnect with stuff. We need to work on perfecting ourselves, work on our characters until we finally become good people. Um. Do, so do I think they're Christian? Yeah, do you or, think they're Christian or transcendentalist? I don't think they're transcendentalist. None of them sound like they're not they believe in like not a specific God in heaven. None of them ever said anything sort of like that. So I don't think they're like that, but I don't know. What makes you guys think they're like that? We well, we can't that's what that's the question we're trying to answer. Oh are they Christian or not? It seems to me with transcendentalism that you can be a Christian and a transcendentalist, but you wouldn't be a transcendentalist in the truest sense. Uh, I think with any belief sp- system, there's like a spiritual side of things where it's like you got to draw some conclusions about God. Um, but you can have the values of transcendentalism and at the same time, ha- like believe the gospel because the values of transcendentalism and Christianity are very much aligned. The only problem with that combination is that trans- transcendentalism stresses perfection uh being a perfect person and good works more than grace and faith Uh, whereas christianity is very much like it is god like transforming you and you have a new self and that is like god not you um and yes like 
you need to work on your character. But at the end of the day, you can't really like change yourself. It's it's like the Holy Spirit's work in your life. Yeah, but you also have to do the work. I, I just, I kind of feel like they're really similar, but like Christianity is more hopeful because you have mm -hmm. actually a hope of doing it. Whereas with transcendentalism, you can't actually perfect yourself, but it's all up to you. Well, I don't think, I don't think you have a hope if you mean doing it by being perfect, which seems to be the main goal of transcendentalism, you never have a hope of being like perfect with Christianity. You just, you already are perfect in the, in the sense that is like the most important. And that's why it's helpful. And, and that you don't have any more sins in God's eyes. But you know, the phrase in the gospel about like working out your salvation or whatever it is, like, I don't know if that's the right phrase, but like it does and that's not in the Gospels, that's in Paul. But it does seem to me that you can be continually refining your new character and continually stamping down... Oh, yeah, old, like going from glory to glory. Stamping yeah. down the old man further and further into his grave so that he comes up less and less to trouble you. It's It reminds me of Can't Stop Thinking, where, like, if you, you always go... Your mind just goes back to stuff, and then you have to pull it away. So it's kind of like that, like the like your old self... <laughs> is like your sinful nature yeah it's not completely dead as long as you're in the flesh like it keeps coming yeah. back and you have to keep pulling yourself away but the thing is you have god's help with that you're not doing it all on your own and well and also it's important to note with transcendentalism like perfection is like the ultimate goal with christianity that's not even the ultimate goal like yeah your character is super important but the ultimate the ultimate goal is to have a good relationship with god and like rely on and like live out god's love and like and that's such a more happy existence and existence and such a like a better thing to focus on than your own progress. Well, so is our conclusion that we think the marches are transcendentalist influenced Christians? That's my opinion. <laughs> what about you, Rose? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't understand it enough to be able to say. Well, because here's the thing. When Joe loses her temper and her mom talks to her about her anger, she literally mentions like she talks about God as if he's a personal you know what I mean? Like a Christian would talk about God. You know? Yeah, like the quote I brought up earlier. Yeah, I definitely think, like I said, I definitely think that their mom's a Christian. Mm -hmm. And I also think that Beth was a Christian. I don't know about the others, though. So. Well, because there's the part where they're all sitting, doing work, making castles in the air. And they're talking about how, like, they're, all, they're, little, they're little pilgrims on their way. Because they play Pilgrim's Progress, you know? They're on their way to the Celestial City, and it's like... Beth will get there, no problem. She's practically already there. It'll be hard for me. I'll have to work my whole <laughs> life and maybe not even get in at all. And it's like... Well, that's just how kids think. That's not really like... Yeah, but like that's not that's not a general understanding of Christian... That's not a Christian perspective at all. <laughs> the closest no. I can think of... The closest thing I can think of is like maybe a Catholic perspective of like you have to like if you commit a mortal sin a mortal sin is a sin that kills the soul and so like you won't go to heaven if you commit a mortal sin and are not absolved of that before you die and also like if you have a bunch of issues still to work out you'll go to purgatory before you go to heaven but yeah that doesn't even work because the marches are obviously not catholic because there's a part where amy's at aunt march's house while beth is sick and her maid esther is a French lady and she gives her like she's really nice to her and she gives her a little she sets up a little prayer room for her which Amy's very grateful for but she gives her a rosary and Amy like hangs it on the wall to be pretty but she doesn't use it because she's not sure of its suitability for Protestant prayers <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I don't I don't I don't know if they're Christian or not because that is weird that scene was a little strange but then in the part where Joe is with Mr. Bear you already read part of this quote Here's what it says after Mr. Bear is done defending God and religion and truth. The old beliefs that had lasted so long seemed better than the new. God was not a blind force and immortality not a pretty fable, but a blessed fact. Like, I'm pretty sure the transcendentalists don't believe in immortality except as a pretty fable. And the old beliefs that had lasted so long, like that has to be referring to Christianity, God was not a blind force. Clearly, Joe believes in a Christian conception or something akin to a Christian conception of God and religion. And when Mr. Bear defended that, she was like, thank you for defending what I know to be true, but couldn't remember why it was true. 
and that was kind of where it ended for me i was like i guess i think they're christian maybe just influenced by transcendentalism yeah yeah i would i would agree with you you would agree with me mm-hmm. and what do you think about his, their dad i don't know their dad seems like the same as their mom yeah. in, in his belief system and I'm also assuming that she wouldn't marry someone who was, like, completely different in beliefs as her, so yes. And you also have, she was talking to Joe about her temper. It sounds like he helped her with it. Yeah. So, unclear, but that is the viewpoint we're leaning towards. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Rose. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> we had an oldest sister, a middle sister, And then we had to add you to fill it out with a youngest sister, since it was a sister book. Thank you for listening to the eighth episode of The Two Retired Homeschoolers. Join us two weeks from now, when we review sermons by Charles Spurgeon. Bye. Hasta la vista. Adios. (laughs) We're Nora, Mr. O'Malley. We didn't think of a um, thing of a jig. I was always under the impression that, like, good writing should have morals and it should have a point to it. I mean, you really can't write without there being a point. <laughs> Why did you guys look at each other? <laughs> <laughs> you, it was the fact that her um, earbud fell out, so she couldn't hear you. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. I thought you were making fun of me because I'm insecure. But this is Rebecca and Holly doing it, so who is going to expect it to be actually on time? (laughs) Hush. Speak where the microphone can hear you.